Hello, everyone. Please take your seats so we can resume. Thank you very much for those who took this seriously, this point about being here back on time. And in order to finish with the first flot, slot of this day's activity, I'd like to invite Kim Davis to come up. We're going to have a presentation by Ayana. The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. So I'd like to welcome Kim Davis, who is Vice President of IANA Services and President of Public Technical Identifiers, who will be making this presentation. Bienvenido, Kim. Es un placer tenerte aquí. Tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Hola a todos. Pido mis disculpas por tener que hablar en inglés, pero está bueno venir aquí a mi primera reunión de LACNIC luego de la pandemia. Como escucharon, soy parte del equipo de los de la Autoridad para Asignación de Números de Internet y vamos a estar hablando de un par de temas que espero sean de interés de ustedes. Para los que no conocen esta autoridad para asignación de números de Internet, IANA, nuestra principal responsabilidad es mantener registros definitivos de identificados únicos de asignaciones. Y en términos generales, cualquier dispositivo que se conecta, conecta a Internet tiene que comprender cuáles son las comunicaciones que recibe y que envía. Y nuestra función es que se asignan y se distribuyen de manera coherente. Todos los que están aquí están familiarizados con algunos puntos. Las direcciones IP son las más obvias para esta comunidad, pero también hay una gran cantidad de identificadores que nosotros mantenemos en distintas facetas de la comunicación de Internet. La mayoría son parámetros de protocolos. Son los protocolos que se utilizan para comunicarse a través de software. Generalmente no son visibles por los usuarios finales de Internet. Es algo de lo que ellos no tienen que digitar, pero son fundamentales para asegurar que se realicen comunicaciones de manera correcta. Generalmente trabajamos el trabajo en tres categorías. Uno son los números de dominio, a los que me referiré en breve. Luego son los recursos numéricos de Internet. Y en tercer lugar tenemos el tercer punto que son los parámetros de los protocolos. En primer lugar, voy a dedicarme a hablar sobre la función de eh, asignar los nombres. Parte de nuestra responsabilidad es gestionar la zona raíz del DNS y también mantener el trust anchor, el anchor, ancla de confianza de DNS. Una parte importante en la cual hemos estado trabajando en los últimos años es el rediseño y la reimplementación de nuestro sistema de gestión de la zona raíz. Esto es uno de los sistemas más críticos que operamos y es la forma en que los gestores de los TLD interaccionan con nosotros y mantienen esto en Internet. Utilizamos ese sistema para procesar. Um, and it was really showing its age. And we'd been hearing from top level domain administrators that it was important that we continue to evolve uh, adding new functionality. Um, and we didn't feel that it was the right base to use uh, the existing system for our future growth. So after some consultation, we decided to do a ground up rewrite. We re implemented the system from scratch. Um, and that's allowed us to add some significant new functionality for top level domain administrators. Um, one, uh, one facet of this new system is providing an API for our customers. So now top level domain operators can integrate with our system, removing a lot of the manual interaction that has happened in the past and allowing systems to be integrated to one another. Uh, our initial focus is on bulk operations. One thing that we didn't envisage 20 years ago was single uh, entities operating hundreds and hundreds of TLDs. Everything made an assumption that most organizations ran one, maybe two or three TLDs, but not much more than that. Uh, today's operational environment is very different. We have large scale registry service providers. 
that operate many, many different TLDs, and this provides them with a new way of interacting with us that's much more efficient and effective. Um, another thing that we've done is we've separated some of the technical check uh, systems out of our system that allows us to independently evolve how we do technical checks. Um, our goal there is to uh, continue to monitor state of the art in how technical checks should be operated and continue to evolve that uh, system accordingly. Um, I know there's not a lot of TLD operators in the room today, so I'm not going to get into the deep details, and I know that we're short on time on that. Um, another key change um, that perhaps has broader applicability than just uh, for TLD administrators, um, one of the things that we maintain as part of our root zone obligations is a WHOIS database of what the TLDs are and who operates them. And that model has evolved um, with this new system. In the past, uh, we had in our, in our WHOIS database, we had an administrative and a technical contact for each domain. And each of these contacts served dual purposes. One was to be a public point of contact that anyone could reach out to if they had issues with the domain. And the other was that those contacts were actually required to authorize subsequent changes to the TLD. Um, this wasn't a good marriage of two different functions because generally speaking, a TLD manager wants someone that is senior um, to approve changes to their TLD, which can obviously have very significant consequences. But as a public database, um, generally they want to put their help desk or some other point of contact in the public who is. Um, so we had the situation where, for example, the CEO might be listed in IANA's records as the responsible party for the TLD, but that meant that the CEO received all the customer inquiries for that TLD, which, which wasn't ideal. So in this new system, we've separated those two roles. Now we have administrative and technical contacts in the WHOIS that purely serve a public information purpose, and that allows the right parties to be listed a help desk and the like. Um, and then we've separated out into a new concept called authorizing contacts where TLDs can directly administer who is allowed to authorize what kind of change. Um, we're not finished with our evolution of this system. We're now working on things like multi-factor authentication. Um, it might sound a little weird that we don't have this already. Uh, the truth is that we do have multi-factor authentication, but just not a conventional implementation of it. Um, we're looking to add sort of the common ways people are used to using multi-factor authentication, things like um, TOTP, like a Google Authenticator app, um, pass keys, that kind of thing. Uh, our biggest challenge there is we don't actually know who all of our customers are on a, on a first name basis, if you will. Um, so we're implementing operational procedures to enhance our Know Your Customer procedures um, before we implement that. Um, we're also looking at other technical check improvements, like I mentioned, um, our ability to proactively notify TLDs that there is a problem with their TLD and perhaps offer them a solution on how to fix it. Uh, that's not something we do today, but something we see uh, we would like to implement into the future. All right, so one essential part of operating the root zone is also administering the trust anchor for the DNS. Uh, the root zone key signing key provides an important uh, role in that it is the apex of the trust hierarchy for the domain name system, um, and it is our responsibility to maintain the KSK uh, in an appropriate way. Um, and we do this a little differently to the way most people operate cryptographic key assets. Uh, if you speak to someone that operates sort of an apex key in a cryptographic system, usually they administer it in a highly secret, private manner. Secrecy is the name of the game. Um, and um, we did it very differently. Um, we actually take the very opposite approach. We try to make the way we administer the key highly transparent um, with an open model, an open design, and with very public um, ceremonies where we actually conduct business with the key, which I'll explain on this slide. Um, so 
when we use the key, we want to make sure that the whole community at large trusts that we are firstly keeping the key secure and secondly only using the key for the purposes for which it is designed. Um, and we've designed a model that, as I mentioned, is very open and transparent. And one of the key ways we do that is by having uh, key stakeholders in the community known as trusted community representatives observe and participate in our usage of the key. Um, they come, they're not, they're not staff members of ICANN, they're not staff members of IANA. They come and oversee the work that we do and they report back to the community um, that we're operating the key in an appropriate manner and provide their expert advice on what we can be doing um, differently. Um, in doing this, we think diversity is extremely important. We want to have different people with different perspectives um, overseeing the work that we do, providing us with new insights into how we can improve the system. Um, so we're always looking for additional volunteers in these kinds of roles so we can continue to build a better system. Um, diversity of skills is important, but also diversity of location is important. Um, each of these trusted community representatives holds access to a, a key. Um, you might have heard of the seven key holders for the internet. Um, that's, a, that's a reference to, to these volunteers. Um, and it's important that those keys are distributed geographically so that there's no risk that they're, um, they're all in the same place at the same time, except when it's, it's expected. Um, we've had really strong participation from Latin America in these volunteer roles. Um, Carlos Martinez, who introduced me, also Nicolas Antoniello, who's here, Frederico Neves, who's here as well, uh, Jorge Edges, uh, Hugo Salgado, have all been volunteers um, from this region in these roles. Um, if this kind of uh, activity you think fits within your expertise, or you know someone that you think might be a good fit for this kind of role, I really do encourage you to submit a statement of interest uh, to us. Uh, we are inducting a new class of trusted community representatives right now, so it is absolutely timely to identify new candidates for these roles. Um, so please visit iana.org slash TCR uh, if you want to submit a statement of interest in performing this kind of role. Um, part of operating the key, it's a, it's a cryptographic key, and cryptographic keys have a certain expected lifetime um, just due to their resiliency to attack and so forth. Um, and we're actually now embarking on our second ever replacement of the key. Um, Bear in mind, this key is extremely difficult to change because every DNSSEC validator around the world needs to know about the key. So every time we change the key, um, there is a huge effort to propagate knowledge of the key via automatic update mechanisms, um, working with software vendors and the like. So it is a multi-year process every time we want to change this key. Um, we started DNSSEC in 2010. The first key rollover happened in 2018, and we're now looking at performing the second key rollover. Um, that work started this year. Um, our anticipation was we generate the key early this year. We would then have a roughly two-year propagation period um, to get software vendors to learn about the new key. Um, and ultimately, in late 2025, we would switch to using the new key. Unfortunately, our plans have been impacted by um, our, one of our key hardware vendors has essentially decided to exit the business. Uh, this is the, the vendor that implements the hardware security modules we need to store the key securely. Um, this has caused us to pause this work. We're now evaluating new vendors. Um, we hope to make a decision on what our new vendor will be by the end of this year at which point we expect to restart this process. So I think everything on this timeline will likely shift out a year. So um, we'll probably regenerate the third key in early 2024, have another two year propagation period and likely put the key into action in 2026. Um, another thing I should mention, um, we currently use RSA SHA-256 as the cryptographic algorithm for the root zone. Um, the root zone algorithm has never been changed, but we recognize we need to have the agility to change it in the future if necessary. 
Um, so there is currently actively community work on deciding the parameters under which the key would be changed in the future. Uh, this community design team is creating a set of recommendations on how um, whether an algorithm change should be done is evaluated, and if it's decided a change should be made, how it should be conducted. Uh, because it's never happened before, and it's the root zone, and it's, it's very critical infrastructure, uh, we're taking the time to make sure we do it right, we get all the analysis, the research done, so that we have a bulletproof implementation before we execute. Uh, just some other root zone operational updates that might be of interest. Um, we're currently implementing zone MD. This is a new record type for the root zone. It allows um, those who run their own um, local root servers, uh, services to um, validate the root zone in a new way. Um, we added a pilot record to the root zone on the 21st of September, um, and we expect full implementation to be complete on the 6th of December. Uh, another operational update is we recently put the .lb uh, domain, Lebanon, into a caretaker designation. Uh, this is the first time we've done something like this. This was a necessary act because of a set of local events uh, that meant that we had to um, remove the, the previous operator from our records. Um, this has triggered a lot of policy discussions within ICANN, and there is an ongoing dialogue about what this means how to codify this practice into, um, into a formal policy and the like. So we expect significant discussions to happen on this uh, in the coming, coming months. We're also working on an implementation of a retirement policy for CCTLDs. Um, each CCTLD is tied to a country. So the obvious question is, when, the, when a country ceases to exist, what happens to their CCTLD? And that's exactly what this policy um, is designed to address. One key thing about this policy is that essentially when a country ceases to exist, there is a five-year window to retire use of the CCTLD. Uh, under certain circumstances, that can be extended up to 10 years, but generally speaking, it gives a clear window of five years for that country to stop using a CCTLD and migrate to the successor country's CCTLD. Uh, lastly, on the root zone, we are preparing for the next GTLD round. Um, internally, work is active on designing that process with the expectation that that round will open sometime in 2026. Okay, uh, switching to number resources, um, IPv4 addresses, IPv6, and autonomous system numbers. Um, all three of these registries we maintain the global address space for. Uh, the vast majority of those um, address, uh, the, the space within those numbering systems are then in turn allocated to regional internet registries like LACNIC. Um, IANA does hold some blocks back, for example, private use allocation blocks, uh, special purpose blocks, um, think multicast, for example. If you want a multicast block, you come directly to IANA. Uh, but unicast address space is allocated through the regional internet registry system. Just a quick status check. Um, it's no surprise, I think, to anyone here, particularly based on the last panel, that we, we well and truly allocated all of our IPv4 stocks quite some time ago. Um, our last slash eight was allocated in 2011. Um, and we had a small amount of recovered address space, and we had an allocation system that was operating between 2017 and 2019, but that space has been exhausted as well. So as of today, we, we don't really have anything to allocate here uh, for unicast usage. IPv6, very different story. Um, unicast is assigned to one eighth of the entire address space. Uh, that in turn can be divided into 512 slash 12s and we've only allocated eight slash 12s out of that space. So in terms of IANA's inventory of unicast address space for IPv6, it's not really a problem at this point. Uh, AS numbers, similar story. Uh, obviously there was some exhaustion when it came to 16-bit address spaces, but now with 32-bit address spaces, that's not really been an issue. Uh, we allocate large blocks to RARs for further assignment within the regions. Uh, we haven't made an allocation in this registry for a couple of years, so uh, and 98% of the address space is still unallocated. Uh, just to wrap up, um, accountability is a very important part of how we operate the IANA. 
We have all sorts of mechanisms available um, to m monitor our performance, uh, to get feedback from our customers. Uh, these include post-transaction surveys, annual surveys, monthly reports, annual reports and the like. Uh, I know the RER community conducts an annual process of reviewing the work that we do. Um, so this is all part of doing the work uh, of the IANA. Uh, you can find more at iana.org slash performance. So with that, thank you very much for your time. I know I've taken a bit of time out of the next session, but I appreciate uh, you listening. Thank you very much.